to the second video for the Maintaining a Balance series. So up till now, we've had a look at why we need to maintain a balance for the sake of homeostasis uh, and had a look at a few examples of some negative feedback mechanisms and how the body works in order to try to maintain this idea of homeostasis. Now, the biggest reason why we need homeostasis is because of these chemicals called enzymes. So we're going to have a look at what enzymes are by looking at this stop point, identify the role of enzymes in metabolism, describe the chemical composition, and use a simple model to describe their specificity on substrates. So it's only one dot point, okay, but it's, a, it's fairly heavy in we need to identify, describe, and use a model. So it is sort of a triple barrel dot point here. So enzymes are naturally occurring chemical substances in the body that help a chemical reaction take place. They are biological, sorry, biochemical catalysts produced by living things. So this means that they are able to lower the energy needed to start a chemical reaction, which is what a catalyst is. They're usually used in small amounts relative to the reactants in the chemical reaction. And basically their job is to modify and increase the rate of reaction without being used up in the process. So it is the job of the catalyst, therefore, and therefore the enzymes, to lower the activation energy or the energy barrier of a chemical reaction. So as we can see here in this graph, we have two lines. So B shows us the amount of energy required for a uncatalyzed reaction to take place, whereas the dotted line C shows us how much energy is required for a catalyzed reaction to take place. So take note, we start with the same amount of reactants and we finish with the same amount of product. We just um, re reduce the amount of energy needed to get to the same point. Okay, so B, we can see we require a larger amount of energy for the reaction to proceed versus C, which is our catalyzed reaction with our enzymes acting. So enzymes are proteins with a specific shape for their specific substrate. Substrates are the substances that are affected by the action of an enzyme. So basically, the reactants of the chemical reaction are the substrate. So the enzyme acts on those and therefore brings about the chemical reaction. When an enzyme acts on a substrate, it readily forms a tra its transition state and the reaction proceeds quicker. Temperature, pH and substrate concentration all have an effect on enzymes as they all have an optimum range for each of these three conditions. If the temperature and pH are not kept within their optimal range, which is different for different enzymes, which we'll be having a look at, the enzyme can denature. So this means that the active site of the enzyme changes its shape and because of this idea of specificity that the enzyme specifically fits a substrate they can no longer fit together anymore and the enzyme will no longer function. So enzyme names usually end with the suffix ace. So for example, catalase, sucrase and lipase. The name often, but not always, identifies the substrate or the reactant that the enzyme acts on. So this can be summarized with the following equation. So the substrate reactant with the enzyme acting on it brings about the products. So we can have a reaction where the substrate is broken down into two products or we can have a reaction where two substrates two or more substrates are brought together to create a product so for specific enzymes the reactions would be as follows hydrogen peroxide in the presence of catalase breaks down into hyd oh, sorry water and oxygen sucrose in the presence of sucrase breaks down into glucose and fructose and fats, which are also known as lipids, in the, pro in the presence of lipase, are broken down into fatty acids. So we needed to have a look at a simple model for enzyme activity. So the two models that we look at uh, that show how an enzyme works are the lock and key model and the induced fit model. So one model used to illustrate the action of an enzyme is the lock and key model, which is this one over here. This is where only one small part of the enzyme molecule can form a complex with the substrate. So as we can see here, we've got exactly the same shape on the active side of the enzyme as we do on the substrate. So this part of the enzyme is known as the active site. 
an enzyme substrate complex forms when the enzyme active site binds with the substrate like a key fitting into a lock. Only a specific substrate can bond in that site and this makes the enzyme specific to that one substrate. So obviously if the shape is different, they're not going to fit together. The induced fit model, which is this one over here, proposes that the active site slightly changes its shape to accommodate the substrate perfectly. The shape of the enzyme must match the shape of the substrate. Enzymes are therefore very specific and they will only function correctly if the substrate matches the active site. The enzyme does not form a chemical bond with the substrate. After the reaction, the products are released and the enzyme returns to its normal shape. Because the enzyme does not form chemical bonds with the substrate, it remains unchanged. As a result, the enzyme molecule can be reused. Only a small amount of enzyme is needed because they can be used repeatedly. So following up with this dot point is this one from the syllabus. Identify data sources, plan, choose equipment or resources, and perform a first turn investigation to test the effect of increased temperature, change in pH, or change in substrate concentrations on the activity of named enzymes. So this is three different uh, experiments or first-hand investigations that are all looking at the different ranges that enzymes need to function in. So firstly, enzymes and change in pH. So we're changing the pH, so this becomes our independent variable. The dependent variable is measuring the enzyme activity. So the particular enzyme that we will be using is catalase. So we'll be measuring the enzyme activity by looking at the height of bubbles produced using a ruler. And some of the control variables that we need to use are the size of the substrate that we use, which in this case will either be potato or liver, the temperature of the solutions, the concentration of the hydrogen peroxide, the amount of solution and the reaction time. So we'll be going through how to do this in class and carrying it out together. As we can see here in this graph, different enzymes have a different pH at which the, they, their optimal activity falls within. So pepsin is a very acidic uh, enzyme, which will be found in the stomach. So its optimum pH is about 2. Salivary amylase, as we can see from the name, is found in our saliva, which has a pH of about 7. And arginase is a intestine-based enzyme, so it has a much lower pH, so it's more in our basic range. The next one is looking at enzymes and changing in temperature. Uh, so again, the independent variable is what we change, in this case the temperature. The dependent variable is the thing that we're measuring, which again is the enzyme activity. This time we'll be measuring the enzyme activity by having a look at how long it takes milk to clot. And some controlled variables include the pH, the amount of milk, which is the substrate, and the time that the reaction is allowed to proceed for. As we can see from this graph, as the temperature increases, the reaction rate increases. So this is because, as we know from our states of matter all the way back in year seven, when we increase the heat energy, there's more collisions that take place because the particles are moving around faster. So we have more collisions between the enzyme and substrate, which is why we have this steady increase in reaction rate. Once we hit the optimum temperature, which for humans is approximately 37 degrees, we have our optimum rate of reaction. Once we move beyond that temperature, however, the enzymes denature, so the active site is changing shape, and therefore they're no longer able to fit with the substrate. So the temperature, as the temperature continues to increase, the reaction rate decreases dramatically. This graph over here shows us the optimum temperature for a human enzyme. Again, as we said, being about 37 to 40 degrees, whereas here we have the optimum temperature for a bacterium which lives in a hot spring, which has an optimum temperature of about 70 degrees. So obviously it depends on the organism and where they live as to what the optimum temperature is going to be for them. And that brings us to the end of this video. So...